it. Amen. I want to uh, give a good God bless you to the ladies of Alpha Kappa Alpha, the Beta Alpha Omega chapter. Amen. Of which my lovely wife is a member. And we thank God for their uh, participation with us today. We thank God for them listening and, and being a part and being among us. And we pray that uh, today is just the first of many, many days that you'll be joining us for our cyber service. We thank God for each and every one of you today. And if you would, I would pray that you would go to your electronic device or, or your paper Bible, however you receive the word of God, and turn to the book of James. The book of James. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. 7 through 10 in chapter 4 of the book of James. And here's what God's word says. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded be afflicted and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness humble yourselves in the sight of the lord and he shall lift you up amen that is the word of god for god's people let us pray eternal god our father we come right down first of all to say thank you Thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice, Father God. We ask a special blessing on them, Father God. Allow your words to minister to them right now, Father God. Decrease me and increase in me. Father God, make it so the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart is acceptable in your sight. And let somebody hear something today, Father God, that causes them to say, what must I do to be saved? Of these things we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God shall stand forever. No word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. Today, beloved, just for a few moments, here's our subject today. It is the tragedy of the two-faced saint. The tragedy of the two-faced saint. Now, we all know people that we consider, based on their own actions, two-faced. And, and, and it's eye-opening and disturbing when someone is exposed in our lives as being two-faced. And there are songs, Brother Dukes, about people like that. Backstabbers. Smiling faces. Thin line between love and hate. And one of the basic expectations that we have of our friends is that they're loyal. We, we believe that the people in our circle, that they're for us and not against us. But many times, First Lady, we find the people who we trust turn out not to be trustworthy. And their allegiance to us is fake. Most of us have had people we've confided in or shared with, and they betrayed our trust. They pretend to be one thing in our face, but reveal themselves as something else behind our backs. We don't expect the ones that we hold dear to be double-minded. We don't expect the ones who pat us on the back to then turn around and t stab us in the back. We don't expect people to be one way in our presence and totally different behind our backs. But the reality is that there are a whole lot of folks who have a personal agenda that's selfish. Does not require loyalty to anyone other than themselves. And the real kicker about these kinds of people is they expect loyalty from you. Now, we're talking about people in general, but the same fault that the world has is in the church. In the epistle of James, 
he speaks of these people and he gives advice to us on how to deal with them. But he also, First Lady, has advice for them. And it's true that the things that we deal with in the world are the same things that we deal with in the house of prayer. And one of the things that pastors and church leaders hear most when we ask the question to potential members, we ask them, why? Why aren't you a part of the church? Why haven't you joined the church? The answer that they often give and most often give it is that they're turned off by the hypocrisy of the church. And the expectation of the non-church member is that the church member be different than they are. You see, there is an expectation Brother Matthew, of sanctification. Now, what the non-member sees is, he sees that the people in the church are not what they're supposed to be. Church folk not living right. How can the non-member join a church when the members cuss more than they do? How, how can they connect with Southside Baptists when they see half the congregation at the South Side Bar for happy hour. Why would they want to join a church where believers gossip and talk about other members more than they talk about God's grace? And in the text, the biblical term that James uses, James calls these kind of saints double-minded. Double-minded saints is what he calls them, but today we call them two-faced. They have a form of godliness, but they deny his power. They can't choose between the streets or the pews. They go from improper behavior in the bedroom to touching and agreeing in the prayer room. Those who are double-minded saints and they behave that way in the street, they have the same behavior in the church. And people see that behavior and they're turned off because it's hypocrisy. And it's true that in this season, we've got a problem with the church echoing the world. The church has allowed worldly things to infect it. And people have a problem distinguishing the difference between the church and the world. The church looks two-faced. The music sounds the same. The people dress the same. They act the same. And the traditional format of church has been called too old fashioned. And in order to keep the church financially afloat, the church has compromised some of its form to take on new fashions with the intent to appeal to the masses. Now, I understand we need to attract believers in order to grow the church, but there's some things that we cannot do as a church. Some things we cannot do as believers. Some things we cannot do as disciples. There's some things that are too holy to compromise. The church and its people, we have to stand on integrity, morality, decency, and stand on the word of God without bending and breaking the true gospel. We need to stand as one with one mind, touching and agreeing that on Christ the solid rock I stand and all other ground is sinking sand. We have to have the commitment to say with conviction, I would rather have Jesus than houses and land. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than fortune and fame. Give me Jesus and I will praise his name. We've got to continue to be strict about some things in the church and in the worship service. There's some things, Brother Dukes, we can't remove or change or else we risk removing God, changing his principles and lowering the minimum requirement for salvation. The Bible is the foundation of our entire faith and we, Greater Harvest, will not muzzle the Bible to try to gain members. When we no longer uphold the standard of righteousness that the Bible requires, we are being double-minded and two-faced. And I can tell you with surety and with confidence that at 541 15th Avenue, we're going to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. 
because the Lord is seeking them who are willing to humbly confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. We believe in one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. And in this season of racial inequality and police brutality, general hatred, uh, government corruption, and, and, and global pandemics, and the church needs to stand up. Church needs to be that beacon on the hill. Church needs to be the safe house. And the most tragic thing that any church could be infected with is an abundance of two-faced saints. Let's look at the text. Now, the book of James is it's most likely the first New Testament book ever written. Uh, there's some debate. Some say that it was Galatians, but uh, there is no, no doubt that James, the writer of this epistle, is the first martyr in the new church. In other words, he was the first one killed for standing up for what he believed. And it's, it's appropriate that the writer of this epistle and this epistle that calls on believers to, to be uh, not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word, he was killed for unwavering in his support and his belief in the gospel of Christ. So James wrote this epistle to the believers who have been scattered abroad after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And his book is designed to give advice, instruction, and encouragement to the new church that's not able to come together and worship in a sanctuary. The new church, that church, they had to meet in people's homes. They had to meet by the riversides. They had to privately worship and pray. They were afraid to gather because it was dangerous to be a Christian at this time when this epistle was written. So James writes this letter to his brethren because they had been dispersed and they were suffering from persecution. For this letter to be real, he couldn't tell them that they would not be tested or tried. But instead, he told me, he said, count it all joy when you're tempted. And if we update the language in the text, we would say, be happy when people try you. Because when people try you, it's going to make you a better person. See, James, I love James because James was not somebody who would sugarcoat his instruction. Uh, James told the people, first lady, that there were going to be trials. He said, but don't worry about the trials because after the trials, there's a crown of glory waiting for you. Amen. And, and, and James tells the people, he says, you know what? There's going to be people that's better off than you. Don't worry about people who have more than you, though, because God is no respecter of persons. No man has a better chance to see God just because he got more money than you. God is no respecter of persons. And James says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. So the worldly things that people have here on earth, those things will pass away. So just be humble and follow God's word and you will be rewarded. Now, for my Bible readers, you know that the, the book of James does not tell a story. There's no historical chronicle of the events that happened. James' desire is just to simply instruct the saints to keep the faith because of the difficult circumstance and time that they were in. And with that understanding, the book makes sense. And we can take the instruction from the book of James and apply it to our lives and especially to our current conditions. I want you to open the text with me. Uh, James devotes uh, the entire chapter 3 to instructing the saints who had an issue Watch this. Their issue was that they envied each other. I already preached a couple of weeks ago about there's nothing new under the sun. But, but, but James, watch this. James actually uses a, a, a the third chapter to explain in detail how hurtful the tongue can be. There's nothing new under the sun. The same thing that James was telling them about in the first century. We need to talk to people about right now james tells them how hurtful it can be uh, when they talk about each other when they fight with each other proverbs tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue and james this wise rabbi he instructs the scattered church to watch their mouths james says in chapter 3 verse 8 he says the tongue no man can tame 
It's unruly evil and it's full of deadly poison. And this chapter, especially right now, seems especially relevant and familiar because uh, the people of today often disparage each other for no good reason. And the current Democratic nominee for vice president has been ridiculed and bashed just for being selected. And it's ridiculous that she's being criticized for her qualifications and her record when the truth be told, her resume is the most impressive of any one of the prospective candidates for president or vice president. But there's a hate that's festering in the hearts of people, people who have an agenda and are afraid of what a powerful woman of color brings to the table. Preach, Pastor, preach. We've got to keep this woman lifted up in prayer because not only does she have haters on the Republican side, but hate is also coming from those who are Democrats and folks who look like her. I don't know about you, but I'm with Kamala. And not because she's black, not because she's a woman, not because she's an AKA. I'm with Kamala because she's qualified. And the book of James gives us perspective on how the enemy uses hate and his minions to destroy the beloved of Christ. James explains that the tongue is a weapon. Chapter 3, verse 10, he says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and curses. And the truth is that the people of God are not always in total agreement. Oh, we agree on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but we disagree on how we're supposed to live our lives like him. We disagree on how we're supposed to talk to people. We disagree on how we're supposed to talk about people. Christ taught us how to live and sacrifice for the greater good. But when it comes to daily living and daily decisions and what daily comes out of our mouths, many of the people of God struggle. And many of the people who are called by his name are not living up to his calling. Can, can I go to the text? Uh, the first six verses of chapter four, James is talking about the arguments among the saints. Uh, people, people, God, we, we have no chance to save the lost if we can't get along amongst ourselves. James speaks to this issue, and, and what I love about James, uh, Sister Dukes, is not only does he not sugarcoat his instruction and his rebuke, but he also recognizes the reason people may have the problems that they have. It, it's a special teacher who does not dismiss the failing student, but tries to understand the reason the student is not learning. Uh, James looked at the reason why, why the beloved of Christ are fighting, why they were committing adultery why they were lusting after things that they could not have and James tells the church that the reason why they're struggling in these areas and struggling with these things is because they have a problem with prayer their prayer was two-faced they were praying for things that God wasn't going to give them see God was not going to bless them with ill-gotten gains God is not going to bless a woman with another man's husband. Preach, pastor, preach. James tells them that the fleshly things that they desire, they're not going to get. And the things that they desire of the spirit, God will bless them with it if they remain humble when asking for it. James says, he says, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. In other words, you're asking for the wrong thing. And for the wrong reasons. You're not asking for it from your spirit. You're asking for it from your flesh. Your requests are for worldly things. And God is not going to feed your flesh. He's going to feed your spirit. So James understands that the wiles of the devil has caused the saints to become two-faced. And James calls them out. He calls them out for praying a two-faced prayer. And sometimes, beloved, Saints do pray a two-faced prayer. Can I tell you what I'm talking about? See, because they have a battle going on on the inside. Uh, here's what it is, Brother Matthew. See, the flesh wants satisfaction. But if your flesh is saying, Lord, help me defeat my enemy because they got it coming. Your motivation for defeating your enemy is so that you can get revenge for something they did. That's not going to work because God said vengeance is mine. 
See, in your spirit, you want the victory, but your flesh wants the glory. That's a two-faced prayer. Because all that you do should be done so that God gets the glory. Somebody, somebody type to God be the glory. See, until you can take the flesh out of your prayer, you're praying a two-faced prayer. And God will not bless you with a two-faced blessing. It's tragic when a saint who considers themselves a part of the body of Christ, uh, 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 it's tragic when they can't get a prayer through. And James understands this, and he gives the tragic two-faced saint, he gives them instruction that's going to change their lives. It's in the text. Can I preach about it? Uh, verses 7 through 10, he gives three points of consideration for jubilation. Can I magnify the text? First point James makes, he says, one, he says, submit and resist text says submit yourselves therefore to god resist the devil and he will flee from you uh see see you've got to stop trying to control things that god is in control of you've got to submit wholly to god you can't waver in other words you've got to be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water and when you submit to god here's the problem when you submit to god there are going to be some things that's going to make you uncomfortable. All right, all right, I, I, I know I'm talking right. There, there's going to be some times when you submit to God, there's going to be some times when you're going to have to be quiet when you want to say something. When you totally submit to God, there's going to be some temptations that you're going to have to resist. But the Bible says, be ye steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. And once you do that, then the enemy can see that you're committed, you're convinced, you're connected, and that's when the enemy will flee. Is there anybody that has a testimony that once you committed to Christ, then he changed your life? Point number one, submit and resist. Point number two, James says, draw nearer to God. Draw nearer to God. Uh, see, you can't be a tragic two-faced saint when you're near to God. How do I get nearer to God? How do you get nearer to God? Well, it's in the text. Here's what the text says. It says, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. In other words, you got to put away some things. <laughs> uh, 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 Brother Tim, you got to put some things down. Uh, see, cleansing your hand don't mean that you got to buy a bunch of hand sanitizer. Don't mean that you got to frequently wash your hands. It means that you've got to stop putting your hands on things and in things that God told you to take your hands off. See, your hands get dirty when you put them in dirt. When God tells you to let something go, that means wash your hands of it, take your hands off it. But, but here's the thing. Watch this. In order not to be two-faced, the thing that God has told you to take your hands off, you've got to take it out of your heart, too. Because if it's still in your heart, eventually it's going to return to your hands. You've got to separate from what God tells you to stop touching. Because as long as you have the desire, the enemy will keep trying to test you and, and, and he'll make you double-minded. You've got you to resist being double-minded and be nearer to God. Song says, draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. And in verse 9, James explains that one of the ways to be nearer to God is to struggle sometimes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody help me preach right here. See, the tragic two-faced saints, when things get tough, they're going to turn away from God. But James lets us know that the hard times, that's the right time to be nearer to God. Can, can I stop on somebody's street? See, in the midnight hour, it's a good time to get nearer. When you're broke, it's a good time to get nearer. <laughs> When you're lonely, that's a good time to get nearer on your bed of affliction. That's a good time to get nearer in your struggle. Hallelujah, somebody. That's a good time to get nearer. 
See, see, only in your darkest hour can you prove that you're not a two-faced saint. See, in your darkest hour, you can prove like Job, you can say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Uh, just like Joseph, you can say what, what you meant for evil, God turned it for good. Uh, when you're able to, uh, to not be a two-faced slain. Uh, you can prove like David. You can say when my enemies, when they came to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. I wish I had some believers and some Bible readers in here. Just type in the comments, I'm not two-faced. You see, when things get hard, that's the best time to get nearer to God. So point number two is draw nearer to God. And point number three, we're about to finish. We're about to close. Point number three says, humble yourself and be lifted. Here's what the text says. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. Hallelujah, somebody. See, that's somebody's hallelujah moment right there. Because the tragic two-faced saint, he can't humble himself. Because his desire is to be exalted. So that's why the two-faced saint tells you to your face, oh, you sure look good wearing that dress. But behind your back, they tell somebody else that you're too big to be wearing that style of dress. See, see, let me tell you, they'll tell you to your face what you want to hear. But they tell somebody else what they really wanted to say. The two-faced saint. They, they, he wants your approval uh, and he wants the approval of everybody else so they can never settle on one opinion. And the real problem is they want glory for themselves. And the only problem is they don't know how to get it. See, they think they can get it by tearing somebody down. They think they can get it by talking bad about their brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, James knew that this would be true. So here's what he said in the text. He says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. You see, when you're dedicated, devoted, and determined to follow Jesus, you can't be double-minded. You can't be two-faced. You won't be seeking other folks' approval. You won't be seeking personal glory. You'll understand we're charged to do great things. And we're charged to do all things decently and in order. You'll understand that the exalted shall be humbled. You'll understand that uh, if you suffer for the cause of Christ, God will take care of you. Humble yourself and he will lift you up. Is there anybody here who wants to be lifted? If you want to be lifted, say amen. Say amen. Humble yourself. Type hallelujah. If you want to be humbled, if you want to be lifted, even in my circumstance, I'm going to be humble. No matter how blessed I am, I'm going to be humble. No matter how good things are, I'm going to be humble. See, I know that I could not and I would not have anything if it had not been for God. God! He does all things well. And even in my moment of sorrow, even in my midnight hour, I'm a witness that God is worthy to be praised. And he'll make a way out of no way. Hallelujah, somebody. All you got to do is be humble and he will lift you up. Mm, won't he do it? Won't he do it, somebody? If you've ever been down and God 
picked you up, turned your life around, set you on a straight path. Hallelujah, somebody. He'll make a way. See, don't fall in the trap of being a two-faced saint. Submit yourself to him. Draw nearer to him and humble yourself and be lifted. Don't allow yourself to fall into the tragedy of being a two-faced saint. Hallelujah. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one God who is able to deliver us from any obstacle, any enemy. Though we are, we see trouble on every side, we're not in distress. Even though we're perplexed, uh, we're, we're, we're not disturbed. And even though we're persecuted, we still have a praise. And I, I just pray today that that we allow the Lord to use us and use us in a mighty way. Don't be a two-faced saint. Be dedicated to the Lord. Have a single mind, a single heart, and a single goal, and that is to be the best believer, the best disciple, the best Christian that you can be. To God be the glory for the things he has done. That's the word of God. Amen. I just pray somebody will be helped today. Again, thank you, uh, praise teams. Thank you for our, our trustees who came out on yesterday and collected our tithes and offerings. And thank each and every one of you who did come out. Amen. And bless us. Bless the church so that we can continue to keep on keeping on. Uh, we thank God for you. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Let's pray. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy. The only wise God, our Savior, power and dominion, glory and majesty, both now and forevermore. And everybody said amen, amen, and amen. Again, thank the 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 glorious ladies of AKA, the Beta Alpha Omega chapter. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Y'all have a wonderful day in the name of the Lord.